Uh, all right, Eric, uh, you can start now. Thank you. Sounds great. So with the slides that are up, what I want to talk about is security since Java 8 and just what's been going on in the overall uh, Java ecosystem. So to introduce myself, my name is Eric Koslo. I began a long time ago in terms of software engineering. Uh, after I performed in the circus for a while, I went into software engineering, writing Java applications. And then starting at about 2009, I switched to do software security consulting of figuring out ways to compromise different applications, how to help people build newer applications. And since then, I've become very Java focused in the realm of how do we assess the security of Java applications, both from the JVM as well as applications. And I was also one of the former product managers of uh, the Java platform for Oracle. And now I work at a company called Azul that produces uh, one of the JVMs um, called Azul, Zulu, and Zing. Outside of that, uh, in the overall community, I'm a member of the InfoQ editorial team on the Java Q. And I also have a class on uh, hands on cryptography with Java to help people secure Java applications. Um, and last year, a number of us through a community called Fuji started doing just a jug tour, going around sharing our expertise with members of the community. And I did a number of presentations at different jugs, Silicon Valley jug, Central Iowa jug, Knoxville jug, I'm probably missing some others. And I just gave a presentation about how Java applications are attacked. And one of the interesting things that pertains to security is that there's always some kind of exploit going on. So for a while last year, I was talking about an exploit that went on in uh, Atlassian Confluence that was so major that the US Cyber Command warned about it. Then back in December, there was log for shell going on that took over a significant number of Java applications. And just in uh, last April, we had uh, Spring for shell as well as a CVE called the uh, Psychic Signatures in Java. And the way that I want to break this talk down is to break it down into three key parts to focus on first, how Java applications are attacked. What are the risks that are going on and what are the ways that people are attacking different applications to break into them and pose a risk to your applications and the data that you have? The second is what's been going on in Java recently? How has the platform evolved since about the Java 8 timeframe? And what are the things that are coming soon so that we could realize the way that the ecosystem is evolving to mitigate a lot of these threats? And third is to leave with a series of defensive steps that people can do. These are the takeaways that you can do in your applications, in your runtimes, and just ways that you can go to keep your applications more secure to have a proactive defense. Now, one of the first things that I want to do is to go and just give a quick opinion because everybody said, uh, I always get the question of, oh, are you going to say something? Am I going to hear some bad stuff? I find that generally speaking, the Java teams and the Java community are doing a pretty good job of maintaining the security of the overall platform, which involves the JRE itself, as well as a number of the libraries and the places where people get those libraries. So whereas uh, a little over a decade ago, there was a reasonable amount of risk with the realm of like applets and the sunsetting of those from browsers. Now, a lot of that has been mitigated. There's a series of significant controls in place, both technical controls as well as community controls. And the risk to Java applications has actually more to do with the way that they're put together and the types of data that they have. So the risk has shifted from being a technological risk of how do I defend my, my Java assets to now focused on the realm of what is the business goal that I'm actually trying to accomplish by the act of writing this code? What are the libraries that I'm taking? And how do I piece these applications together? Because that's what it is that we're actually processing. And that's the reason why we take these applications and deploy or migrate them to the cloud. So to look at a series of the CVEs and the vulnerabilities that we talked about a little bit ago, um, when I first started giving these presentations, uh, Atlassian Confluence was being attacked where attackers would just go and they would load up a Confluence instance and they would send a customized parameter to that uh, Confluence instance. And what Confluence would do in that case is it would take that data that came from the user and it would pass it almost directly to a special library called OGNL, which stands for Object Graph Navigation navigation language. And the way that these attacks really looked is you look at the query string, the basic thing that everybody can manipulate. And the way that they were attacking it in this case was to just send data in a Unicode format. So that AAA backslash U0027 
what the attackers were doing in this case was to just go in there and provide an OGNL expression that went after java.lang.runtime and told it to just execute a function. And what would happen is Confluence would look at that and it would say, well, of course I'm going to run these URL parameters that you gave me. Why wouldn't that be code? And of course, Confluence would just be simply taken over as a result of um, that being a CVE. Like you can't just execute and download code from anyone on the internet. So you just take over a Confluence instance. So is OGNL safe? OGNL is a perfectly safe library to use, but don't take remote input and pass that input as a code, or it gives people literally the ability to execute code on your server. Another vulnerability that occurred back in December of last year, it was called Log4Shell. A number of people had to deal and scramble with that. It was a full remote unauthenticated compromise, allowing remote code to be executed in a JVM when that JVM logged a certain signature. And you can see that, sign the, that signature and the code on the right uh, on top of that license plate. And what happens is an application goes and it downloads and processes a lot of data and it writes logs as it did that. Well, if the logger ever encountered a certain string or pieced that together in some way, what would happen is it would go out and it would try to fetch uh, a bytecode at that JMDI location right there. And if it was able to uh, download that, it would go and it would download the code, the jar file, the bytecode at that location, and the JVM would execute it in order to try and uh, run its code properly. So what happens is if you had something that operated in like computer vision and you decided to say, what's the license plate of this car? The natural thing that you would do is to log what you saw as the license plate. So what your JVM would do in this case, if you're using the vulnerable version of Log4Shell, is it would log and it would say license plate found was JNDI LDAP. I'm going to go download the code from that location and I'm going to run it. Naturally, that led to a remote code execution vulnerability and hurt a significant number of servers. There's other attacks. Um, we talked as we segued into here about uh, application servers and web logic and things. Um, deserialization has been a common class of attack where applications receive serialized data. And as part of what the, the application says the data is, it tries to run some of the code that it gets as part of the serialized object. Uh, and that leads to a number of system takeovers. Spring 4 Shell, similarly, uh, what happens is the applications are taking various levels of remote data and they're just executing code uh, on these. And another CVE that went on, this one was just patched in the April critical patch update of all the different JDKs. It was called a Psychic Signatures. Uh, yep, there's the link right there. Um, what this says is effectively, if you give a Java platform a certificate, a certain set of certificate that goes between like the number of zero and one for elliptical curve DSA, then the platform just became a little too trusting of that certificate and uh, would basically believe anything that that certificate said. So uh, the way to patch this is to update your JDK. But what's different about this attack here and passive signatures versus the other ones that were remote code execution is that this one is a little more passive. And the risk here is that that uh, encryption algorithm is part of the default TLS 1.3 implementation where a lot of uh, cryptographic operations take place. So the common thread in all of these CVEs is really a mixing of data and code where a lot, in the case especially of the remote code execution vulnerabilities, the application would take uh, the data that came in and whereas that was supposed to be data, the JVM would actually execute it. And in the case of the psychic signature one, uh, as well as a number of the others, the problems occur actually in downstream dependencies or libraries that the application actually uses. So in the case of Log4j, in the case of Spring4Shell, in the case of Confluence, each of these vendors who produced the library or the application, they patched and they fixed these vulnerabilities. But if you don't take those patches and those security patches and apply them and install them in your environment to mitigate the vulnerability, then you're still vulnerable and at risk. So a key thing if you want to focus on how to improve your security is don't mix data and code to take information from a remote user 
And when there is a CVE or a known vulnerability in one of your dependencies, go through and take the time to update that dependencies. We all make mistakes. I don't want to say that Log4j is a bad library. It's great. Spring, we just heard from Josh about how great Spring is and how helpful it is for people who want to do cloud migrations. They're excellent libraries and frameworks, but please take the latest and most secure versions. But why do these things matter to developers in this area? Um, well, when it comes to security vulnerabilities, we have a couple years ago, Equifax lost a ton of data, especially in the United States. Your data was probably in it. The problem came from an unpatched version of Struts. There was a CVE, a known vulnerability in that version of uh, Apache Struts. And as a result of that, they lost a significant amount of data and they were fined about $575 million. Who did that fine? It was the Federal Trade Commission. This is an organization that deals with uh, security in the consumer markets and has actually been active in the past in um, the Java communities. They're the ones who settled with Equifax in that 2017 breach and issued the fine. And during the Log4j problem back in December, um, the Federal Trade Commission actually came out and they made a statement. And normally when you present, you're not supposed to read the things that are directly on the slides, but I'm going to read this quote here because it's particularly important to Java developers. When the FTC came out with a statement here, they said, the Federal Trade Commission intends to use its full legal authority to pursue companies that fail to take reasonable steps to protect consumer data from exposures as a result of Log4j or similar known vulnerabilities in the future. Now, it's relatively rare for those of us in the software development community when a governmental organization steps forward and basically says, hey, remember us? We're the guys who issue the fines if you fail to patch. We know about this vulnerability. So if, you're, if you have uh, vulnerable dependencies in your application, especially Log4j, which they list by name here, it's probably going to be time to upgrade those libraries. Um, and over the course of doing about 10 years of application security, I've heard a lot of people say like, well, I can't get to that now. I, I get it, but these organizations are there. So like, of course, it's going to come from you. I have a bit of a sarcastic thing over on the right of, you know, you're totally busy here. Don't worry about it. The, if you leave these vulnerable dependencies out here, you know, you know full well what you're getting into and what your problems are going to be. But What's happened in the realm of Java security? What are the things that I can take advantage of in my platform to benefit from enhancements that have been made? And what should I know about what's gone on between Java 8 and Java 17? As Josh said before, it's twice the number, so it's twice as good. The major events that I see in the Java community that have gone on are a couple of them. There's modularity, there's a predictable release cadence, a lot of uh, talk went on in terms of security manager deprecation that just occurred in Java 17, and then a couple other defenses in the ecosystem. So modularity is something that was introduced back in Java 9. And what I like particularly about modularity is it focuses on a decreased attack surface and really the boxing in of possible threats. Because if we look at the number of modules that go into the Java platform back when modularity was introduced, we see things like java.sql.rowset, java.instrument, java.desktop, java.management. And the nice thing that these do in a security landscape is they take a number of the threats that can occur against an application or the way that people can break in, and they put them into nice little boxes because when they're in boxes, you can start to deal with them. So the java.xml module, for example, there's a number of attacks that go on against XML, one of which is XML external entity injection, where you can request files off of other people's system by referencing it as a file to include in the XML document. There's also XML bombs, where you can just cause things to explode by referencing objects themselves and make them take up a huge amount of memory. And by that simply being present in java.xml as a module, I can start to deal with that as a box. Similarly, java.compiler, now that that's in a box, I can start to deal with the concept of JSP injection attacks as a box of something to deal with. Same thing with java.sql. If I want to worry about SQL injection, I should only worry about that if I actually use the java.sql module. Um, and I'll talk about how to deal with that and what to do with those boxes in a little bit. But the next thing that I want to focus on is the role of a predictable, planable release schedule. 
a new Java distribution comes out, a new JDK comes out about every three months, and a new major version comes out about every six months. And within these, these cycles, between all the vendors, between Azul, between Azure Oracle, between Microsoft, between Eclipse, there's periodic instances of long-term support releases. Now, the long-term support releases that we have in the community that you can use are Java 8, Java 11, Java 17, and probably in the future, Java 21 is going to become one of them. And as Azul looks at a number of the Java distributions in the market, you see that there's Java 8, Java 11, Java 13, Java 15, Java 17. And the, the thing here is not to look at this and try to memorize a, a large cycle, but just to recognize that every once in a while, there's a new Java version that comes out. And if I want to use like a Java 12, I can certainly do that, but I should plan on upgrading relatively quickly to Java 13 when that one comes out. Then I can go to Java 14 and spend a little bit more time at Java 15. So the major aspect that you want to pay attention to here is the fact that there is an update, which is how do I upgrade to the latest, most secure version inside of a single JRE, and an upgrade, which is how do I go between JDK 11 to, let's say, JDK 17. So by focusing on my ability to stay on a green distribution where my Java platform is fully supported, I now know that I'm going to get security patches for that JRE when they come out. Now, another thing that I want to cover in the realm of Java security is a deprecation of the security manager. This occurred back in uh, Java 17, um, a couple, you know, actually, yeah, last year. Um, and in Java 17, one of the things that they did is they proposed to deprecate the security manager and they went through to deprecate it and marked it with a deprecated annotation. Now, what that means is it doesn't mean that the security manager is removed. It's still there. If you are using it, you're still welcome to do that. But if you didn't use it, don't start using the security manager. And as part of InfoQ, I covered a couple different articles on this. And the reason that it's deprecated is that the usage of the security manager and its use relative to different attacks and different threats wasn't really there. There were very few people who actually used the security manager. A couple people did. A couple different organizations did. Yes, there were some projects that use it. But the number of different groups and teams that used the security manager was not particularly large. And just joking around with a number of people, I've made the analogy that security manager is to Java what Radio Shack is to the mall. Because a number of us, especially in technical professions, we all agree that Radio Shack is should be a pretty cool store. You want to pack of resistors? You go to Radio Shack. You want to fix up the, the radio or the walkie-talkie that you found in the attic uh, you know, 10 years ago? Maybe they sell that. But the simple fact is nobody really shops there. And when we come time to say, where do I want to go to buy something? None of us actually went to Radio Shack, uh, even though we all thought it was a cool store for somebody else. Now, the security manager architecture was also, um, this is a thing that was created back in uh, the old Netscape Navigator days, and it was primarily aimed to defend against uh, Java applets, which is the role of portable code. How can I download code from someone else's system and run it on my computer without having to worry about my computer being compromised? It wasn't designed to defend the backend application. It was designed to defend a local computer from being attacked in the days before JavaScript was really able to interact and do uh, quite a few things. So this is why the security, ma um, security manager dealt with browsers and applets that did a lot of work with the NP API, the Netscape plugin API. And what I found particularly interesting is in spite of about a 10 year career in the application security realm, I met more people um, in about the six week period of writing two articles about the security manager than I did in 10 years of professionally going around and talking to software professionals. Um, lastly, security needs context. Um, if you want to create a security manager policy file, do you know what policies you need or what files you need to run inside of a Tomcat or a JBoss? I certainly don't. Do you know, um, in the case of the Atlassian Confluence vulnerability, what uh, OGNL statements you are accepting to run? I have no idea what those are. If you need to deserialize data, do you know what those classes are? 
I sure don't. So most of us had no idea what to provide the security manager and able to be actually able to use a policy file. Um, but one of the major improvements that's gone on in the Java platform is the presence of security events inside of JDK Flight Recorder, where the Flight Recorder, which is a tool, diagnostic tool to analyze what a JVM is doing, it actually tracks and records various levels of security information. So with the realm of deserialization attacks, one of the features that was introduced to Flight Recorder last year was the ability to record which classes are being deserialized. And by recording the classes that are being deserialized, you're able to take advantage of other defenses in the platform, such as the JEP290 deserialization filters. So whereas before that feature was introduced in Flight Recorder, if you said, well, which classes should I place in this serialization allow list? Most of us would have absolutely no idea what we should put in there, so we couldn't have provided a policy file. But now that I have the ability to extract the policy, the, the listing of application classes that I'm deserializing through Flight Recorder, I now can go and tell my application, here are the classes that I know I need to deserialize, so please only allow those classes to be deserialized, and I have the capability to apply an active defense. Now I want to go in and talk about the realm of defensive steps that you can actually do. So as someone who's building a Java application or running a Java application, these are the things that you can readily do in your environment to take advantage of different security practices. Um, the summary of the steps here is number one, maintain that patch cadence with the JDK in your library. The fact that the Java distributions come out on a, a, a predictable schedule means that I can plan that in to know to upgrade every once in a while. Two, I'm going to shrink the attack surface. I'm going to take advantage of modularity to decrease my overall attack surface and become less vulnerable to threats. And third is to apply some other JDK features. Now, when the Java platform comes out about every three to six months, um, what I know is that in about three months from now, three months from April, there's going to be a new version of Java. So I can go through and I can plan an update. If I want to use Java 17, I know that there will be 17.0. a number in uh, about three months from now. Now, if you can't go and you can't patch that every three months, maybe that's a little too much. I understand. Nobody's here to come and tell you, hey, you have to update everything. And within three months, you have to do it on the day. It's okay if you need to plan and schedule and defend in different ways, but just don't sit on a JRE and say, like, Java 6 is fine for me. I'm going to use this thing for the next 12 years. Don't do that. Just get in the cadence of every once in a while, about every three to six months, do what you can to patch your JDK and get it from an actually reputable Java vendor because there is something called Mystery Meet JD Open JDK out there where different people build it and report a version, even though it doesn't have the right security patches. Kind of weird. Um, same thing, monitor your libraries. So any dependencies that you have, periodically update those libraries, periodically update those dependencies. If you use log4j, every once in a while, you want to rev that version so that you don't become vulnerable to like the next log4j that comes out. And if you don't do that, that's the thing that Equifax didn't do. And it's one of the reasons that they got that $575 million fine. And also their CIO went to jail. He didn't go to jail because he didn't patch the vulnerabilities. He went to jail because he did insider trading on the knowledge of vulnerabilities. But still, anytime prison is involved, you generally don't want to be there. Now, uh, another thing that you can do in the Java platform is there's a tool called JLink within it that you can use to reduce the overall attack surface of your application. So what JLink does is it creates a self-standalone JRE for that individual application. And what it does is it actually removes a number of the modules. So for example, if you're not using java.xml and you remove the java.xml module, then you don't need to worry about anything in terms of XML bombs or XML external entity injection. If you remove java.compiler, there's no way that you can be hit by a JSP injection. So technically, you shouldn't be worried about these things anyways, because you are not using XML. Why would XML load? Well, maybe it's fine to not worry about that. But the simple fact is you can't attack what isn't there. So by taking JLink to remove modules and just not having those modules at all, you're definitely not vulnerable because people can't attack what isn't there. 
Another thing that I would do is to leverage JDK Flight Recorder. So as I'm monitoring the performance of my application, I want to be able to record and stream different security sensitive events as well. What classes am I deserializing? What files am I accessing? What database queries am I running? By having a lot of this information come to me, I can gather a significant amount of this information and I can have a lot of it come my way and just get a feel for what's the security of my application and I can get the benefit of some aspects of performance. Now, in the realm of security and just uh, overall community, um, one of the questions I'm asked on a regular basis is, how do I get access to some more information and where can I go to just learn generally good things? Um, outside of uh, an individual tutorial, what I want to cover is just a series of people in the community who are quite good and quite knowledgeable about uh, the realm of Java application security. Um, I'm up in the top left. That's me, uh, Koslo on Twitter. I don't post a ton. I probably should. I focus on uh, Azul, Zulu, and Zing, um, which are the JVMs that are provided by Azul. And my specialties is, or my my special expertise is uh, Java security. Also, reporter on InfoQ. Um, down in the bottom left, some other people who are quite knowledgeable to pay attention to are Jeff Williams and Arshan Dabergiagi. They were the founders of Contrast Security. They do a lot to handle a number of different languages, and they've published a lot of helpful information, like an, Jeff wrote an Enterprise Rootkits paper a while ago. Uh, a lot of this information is just helpful, and it's nice to have some generally good takes. Otherwise, in the top right, one of the people who was involved with the deprecation of the security manager, his name was Ron Pressler. He's a member of the Oracle Java team. He's the primary guy on uh, Oracle Project Loom in uh, Java. I forget which Java version that's coming out at. But I found him to be a pretty knowledgeable person about uh, security in general, and he tends to have a lot of really good opinions. So when Ron says something or just has an observation on things, I find him to be a generally good guy to pay attention to. Um, lastly, if you're looking for a group that you can join or an area where you can just find uh, what are a lot of things that are happening in the overall Java community, I'm a member of a group called FUJ. It stands for Friends of OpenJDK. The Twitter handle is FUJIO. So if you're looking for how do I just hang out with a number of people in Java, how do I just talk and get a feel for what's going on, feel free to jump over to FUJ, make some friends, uh, join. If you want to write an article, that sounds great. Um, just come join and hang out over on the FUJ community. And with that, I want to say thank you very much to everybody for listening. And the primary takeaways that you can do on your own individual Java applications is one, update your Java about every three to six months as best you are able. Update your dependencies also. Two, if you have an application that you're distributing and deploying to an area, do what you can to shrink that JRE down with JLink because you'll reduce the attack surface. And three, use J a JDK Flight Recorder as you're able to extract a significant number of security events. And if you do those three things, you'll hit a relatively decent baseline in terms of security and be able to improve your applications. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Eric. Uh, it's good. It's always uh, uh, good to see a security talk because uh, uh, you know, as we as developers don't put too much work on that. We don't pay attention. It's something that sometimes it's an afterthought. Sometimes like build the application, deploy, and then we fix security. But I think uh, the industry as a whole is doing this like shift left security approach where security is is a first thought, not a, a, an afterthought. And uh, having these resources, I think it's it's quite interesting how how you're seeing developers reacting to to these needs and uh, uh, the toolings the, the tools available are, are good. But is there anything else that could be done in general? Yeah, the tools that are available to to your average developer are are pretty decent. Like they're they're pretty good. They'll get you a lot of the information that you need in terms of reception for using those tools. Um, people care about security. The developers are are happy to do it. They just need a clear articulation as to what that is. Because what I found from a lot of people and having been in um, the security groups, both on the giving and receiving end of advice, is that often the advice is like vague or impractical. Like one of the, the pieces of advice that I always hear is validate your inputs. Well, validate them for what? Because the way that I want to validate an input against SQL injection is very different than the way that I want to validate it for, um, uh, for path manipulation. 
So the one of the things that I like um, that's going on in the community right now and with kind of less of the shift left is defending based on context, which is what are you actually trying to accomplish uh, through this code? And so I just do security by asking two simple questions, which come from uh, actually the there was an old Microsoft guy who did a threat modeling card game, which is what assets, what are you trying to defend and what are you defending it from? And if you just focus on those questions, it's actually not all that hard. Awesome. Uh, thank you.